Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a uh, a, a different, somewhat unusual, and we'll call it resilient episode of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you, Hoyles and Brooks as well, along for the ride. Three different locations we're coming at you from this morning. This episode is presented, of course, by the team at Bitcoin Well. Why do you need to use Bitcoin Well, you may ask? You go, I'm seeing all these commercials on TV. My friends are telling me about all these apps. I don't understand why I would need to visit Bitcoin Well if I can just buy Bitcoin by way of this app. Aha! Did you know Bitcoin Well is the fastest and safest way to buy Bitcoin? That's right, the safest way. Well, what could be unsafe about it? Better talk to them. You'll find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, as mentioned, I'm coming to you from uh, Casa Jesperson this morning. I am at home. Uh, Sarah Hoyles, the editorial producer of this program, as well as working from home. And our technical producer, Samuel G. Brooks, is uh, holding down the fort, uh, coming to us, opping this show from the Real Talk studio. We intended originally uh, to be with you on Monday, January 3rd. But but our team and our reality, like like so many other people's, uh, well, we, we've encountered some challenges and uh, we've been invited to test our flexibility. And that's exactly what we've done. I don't have to tell you that this Omicron uh, variant, variant, <laughs> the Omicron variant is asserting itself uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, no laughing matter. Obviously, we see case counts uh, in our home province of Alberta and in a one day period, more than 6000 new cases. And of course, these are just the cases that are being confirmed. These are positive PCR tested cases. That number does not reflect uh, the number of, of, no doubt, thousands of positive cases that have been confirmed by rapid tests in people's homes, uh, people that are isolating. Uh, and that uh, includes our family right now. We have a positive COVID case in our household. And so obviously our house is going to be isolating this week. If you follow my wife, Carrie, on our Instagram, you're getting an insider's look at her journey through Omicron. Uh, I can tell you that, that some of our coverage this week is going to be a little bit personal for me. For example, in our house and many other people's houses, you say, well, what, what about a cor- comorbidity or what, what about some other factor at play that, that'll impact how this household views COVID-19? Of course, you know, because we shared with you several weeks ago that we're expecting a child. And so Carrie, of course, right now is wondering how this variant could variant could impact a pregnancy. That's one thing that we're thinking about. And we know that so many of you on your minds today are thinking about school. And what does the Omicron variant mean for kids? What about those of you that are teachers? We know that thousands of people in British Columbia and Alberta are getting set to head back to the classroom today. That's different than the game plan uh, across the country, for the uh, for the most part, for the rest of the country, including in Ontario, where they're keeping the kids and the teachers home for at least one more week. Now, what's the right call? Who knows? I want to be honest with you. When, when we talk about hosting real talk on this program, that includes every once in a while acknowledging that there may not always be a clear cut black and white solution to something. And so many of you are coming at this school issue from so many different perspectives. I'm grateful for the literally thousands of you that have cast a vote on my unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll. It's the one that I've got up on my profile right now. Uh, I asked Alberta parents, are you sending your kids to school on Monday? Uh, So far, we've got about 4,950 votes. Um, If it is, and this is why we say it's an unscientific, unofficial poll, because You may point out that someone could chime in that's not a parent. Someone could chime in that's not from Alberta, and you would be right. But assuming that this is Alberta parents that are chiming in, 55% of you are sending your kids to school today. 55% are. About 27% of you say that you're not. And then about 18% of you said, well, it's complicated. And you've left us comments. And and you've left us maybe some nuance here. And and we're going to get into those as the show progresses. Jason Schilling will join us in just a few minutes. He's president of the Alberta Teachers Association. We'll get their take on this. And then, of course, as I said in my Real Talk Sunday message last night, uh, if you subscribe to our email, uh, we send it to you every Sunday night. It looks back on the week that was. It looks ahead to the week coming up on the show. Uh, There's a lot going on. 
uh, people are experiencing a lot of feelings right now. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but, but in our neck of the woods, I can speak based on my personal experience. I'm exhausted from this freaking illness. I'm exhausted from this freaking pandemic and what it's doing to everybody's plans and what it's doing to everybody's stress levels. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the division in society. Quite frankly, I'm sick of minus 30 degrees for about three straight weeks. I'm sick of all of our favorite teams being on losing skids. I'm sick and tired of so many things, but there are so many reasons to smile. I had to point it out in my email last night. There are a lot of reasons to be happy and a lot of reasons to be encouraged by what we see all around us. And that includes these free kids cooking classes that Julie Van Rosendahl hosted over the past week or so. She knew that parents all over the place were going, well, what the hell am I supposed to do now? Now that my kid's home from another week from school, we didn't plan on it as a family. What are we supposed to do now? And so Julie put together these impromptu cooking classes. Literally thousands of kids took part. And Julie's going to join us to talk about that a little bit later on in this broadcast. Uh, Sarah Hoyles, of course, as, as the editorial producer of the show, keeps a keen eye on what's going on right now. And Hoyles, I didn't want to come hot out of the gates and lead with this, but we have lost some pretty high profile entertainers, some pretty high profile actors over the past couple of weeks. It's been a while since we've gathered, since we got here together. And of course, that includes Bob Saget. Is that a family member? Is which one, which family member is that chiming in? They, they knew exactly when we were going to pick up your bike and they wanted to say hello right away. Oh, Charlie. That's Char Charlie's just a, half the audience doesn't even know. Ch Charlie's just a wee pop, right? She really is. And she's so. just full of hops. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she's got a lot to say. Um, well, good morning to Charlie. But this is this is this this stuff about Bob Saget. I mean, uh, a, a tragic news. Bob Saget, 65 years of age, um, passing away, uh, discovered in, in a hotel room down in Florida uh, just after uh, doing a comedy show. And, and obviously, really, really sad stuff. Uh, you know, authorities investigating, say, right, right out of the gates. It doesn't appear. As though there was any foul play, there were no drugs involved. Let's be honest; these are all the things that people think about. You kind of go, Absolutely. "Oh my gosh, sudden death, sixty-five years of age." Uh, you know, was it? You know, and I hate to put it this way, but was it drug poisoning? Was it something else? <laughs> Authorities are saying right now it looks like it's, it's just a tragic circumstance. Uh, made, uh, and 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 I don't. I mean, we don't need to sort of qualify this and talk about how tragic it is, or what makes it tragic, or what makes it more tragic. But this post uh, by Bob Saget on his Facebook page. This was just hours. Uh, before he was uh, before his his body was discovered and and, and I think it, it it makes it kind of especially well especially sad Bob Saget posting uh, just hours ultimately before his death uh, okay he says I loved tonight's show at Ponte Vedra Concert Hall in Jacksonville Florida really nice audience he said lots of positivity and it happened last night at Orlando at the Hard Rock Live very appreciative and fun audiences he thanks his opening app act tim wilkins he says i had no idea i did a two-hour set he said i'm back in comedy like i was when i was 26 i guess i'm finding my new voice and loving every minute of it he says i right, see you in a couple of weeks he, he planned to be in west palm beach january 28th he says he'll be there with his brother mike young he says check out my website he says i'm going everywhere in 2022 until i get that special shot and then i'll probably keep going because i refound my comedy mojo and i'm a Addicted to this shit, says Bob Saget. Peace out. And that ultimately being his final public message, Bob Saget passing away at the age of 65. Uh, Hoyles, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, growing up as, as a, you know, 77 born, a child of the 80s and the early 90s, uh, Full House, America's Funniest Home Videos. And of course, it's been a few days, but we can loop Betty White into this conversation as well. Golden Girls uh, and, and Sidney Poitier, for that matter. Um, absolutely loved uh, so many of his his films. But uh, yeah, this is this is a tough blow for a lot of people uh, who really, I think, connected with these celebrities. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's where we went to get our cat videos before uh, the intro. America's funniest, is, uh, America's funniest home videos. America's funniest home videos. Yeah. Yeah, with Bob Saget. And yeah, America's dad. I mean, the funny thing is, is Bob Saget was so raunchy in his comedy. Yeah. If you ever watched the roast of him, or um, 
Yeah, any of his comedy, The Aristocrats, is one of the the films, the doc films about him, with him in it, but featuring him quite uh, prominently. And man, is he raunchy! But I love that. I love that juxtaposition between uh, <laughs> when he would do, you know, Family Guy um, on Full House and America's Funniest Stone Videos, and then yeah, the other side of him. So yeah, multifaceted. He will be missed. As my buddy, uh, yeah, my buddy Dan was saying yesterday. Uh, quite assertively that he believed that Bob Saget's version of the aristocrats is indeed the greatest version of the aristocrats. And if you have no idea what we're talking about, uh, find yourself a quiet space and some headphones, uh, put the kids in front of a board game or a coloring book or something else and check out the aristocrats because it's absolutely amazing and probably the filthiest comedy that you're going to hear in a very long time. So rest in peace, uh, rest in power, as people say. Bob Saget, Betty White. We could have talked like we could talk about Betty White for like an hour. Um, Hoyles, I don't know. And, 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 and what we're like, just almost like ignoring Sidney Poitier, which is is like, I mean, he was a trailblazer, um, an absolute icon uh, when it comes to black actors in film, for starters, and just all time great actors. Uh, but especially considering some of the barriers that he overcame um, and that he shattered. Um, absolutely amazing. But Betty White, what do you say about Betty White passing away? Essentially, not technically, but on the eve, for all intents and purposes, the eve of her 100th birthday, um, a legend through the I, I mean, I saw somebody say Hoyles and I loved this. What a great way to characterize it. Betty White essentially was uh, a, was a, a hero and an icon on television for as long as broadcast television has existed. Pretty amazing. Eight decades, eight decades on television. Um, and yeah, she was one of the first women to really lead a, a, a comedy sitcom. So yeah, and then Golden Girls. The wild thing about that is when you look at the age, uh, what's happening with Sex in the City there, that reboot, uh, just like that, the women in that are older than the what the women were on Golden Girls um, at the time, which is just mind boggling. So breaking a lot of barriers, opening up space for, for women to be in uh in the spotlight so yeah betty white man speaking of raunchy she could be and i loved her for it <laughs> yeah no kidding you know it was wild speaking about the age of the golden girls actors uh or actresses depending on your preferred vernacular it always blew my mind that estelle getty uh sophia on golden girls was actually the youngest one which I thought was like just the craziest part of that. Uh, anyway, what a great story that was, the story of Golden Girls. I think it had to run something like seven years or something like that. It always feels like a lot longer when you take a look at the impact that it had on culture. So Bob Saget, Betty White, Sidney Poitier, and so many others. Let, let's bring our attention closer to home here for a second. In, in just a second, we're going to talk about kids going back to school. Of course, you know, I don't have to tell you this, that this show doesn't happen without the support of amazing sponsors. And that includes the team at Eden Landscaping. They want me to remind you that even though you may be looking to June or July, maybe you've got your hope in a big anniversary event or something special coming up in August, you don't want to be talking to your landscape designer in May, hoping to make it happen, especially with supply chain issues. Now is the perfect time to get in touch with Eden Landscaping. You'll find them online, all of our sponsors, under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where you'll find the team at Park Power. They've been powering our hashtag, Real Talk RJ, from the moment that this show launched. And we're so proud to do business with them, in part because of their sense of of community, how they connect with their community. They take 10% of their electricity profits and they reinvest those back into nonprofits where they do business. You can check out more details online at parkpower.ca. And of course, when you take your business over there, you make sure you let them know that Real Talk sent you. Well, it's uh, British Columbia and Alberta that'll be sending students, kids, uh, EAs, support workers, bus drivers, and everybody else back to school while Ontario and other provinces, territories are keeping their kids home. What's the right move? Well, who's to say? It may depend on your family's circumstance. We wanted to check in with somebody in just a second, Jason Schilling. Uh, this is his wheelhouse, representing thousands of teachers as the president of the Alberta Teachers Association. Um, we're going to get to that, uh, Jason, in just a second, but first, let's tee this up. Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, uh, back on January 5th, about five days ago, speaking with reporters about the decision to send kids and teachers back, and, and here's what the Chief Medical Officer of Health had to say. The challenge that we're facing right now uh, as we look ahead is that we wouldn't know um, necessarily 
what length of time would that be? And again, to just close schools across the entire province as opposed to uh, allowing opportunities to return and then using interventions where they're appropriate in terms of targeted areas. Jason Schilling is the president of the Alberta Teachers Association joining us live this morning. First of all, good morning to you. Happy New Year. This is the first time I'm seeing your face in 2022. How you been holding up? Um, happy New Year to you as well. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's been it's been a go. That's for sure. I don't, I don't know how, how to describe it right now. Um, it's it's in there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, a lot of people just wondering what's going to happen, how things are going to play out. And uh, I, like everybody else, am carrying that stress and that weight and just wondering uh, what what will happen here. Okay, so you've you've got uh, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but you've got thousands of, of teachers, administrators. I mean, you represent the teachers, of course, mm -hmm. uh, heading back to classrooms today. And we've, as mentioned, seeing a pretty strong response to an unofficial Twitter poll that I have about 5000 people have responded. Uh, more than half of Alberta parents chiming in say they are sending their kids back to school. A lot of them are saying we have no choice. Uh, you know, our, our jobs aren't flexible mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, many people wrote in to say I'm a teacher. So my kids are coming to school with me when I go. Others are saying we think that the social uh, interaction is extremely important. Uh, we've heard that the Omicron variant is relatively mild with regards to symptoms. And so we're not as concerned about it as we may have been uh, with others. Uh, thousands of different case by case scenarios, right? The same is going to go with the teachers, I'm sure. Well, you know, ultimately, teachers want to be at school working with their students. And we know that that is um, a really important aspect to their education. It's an important way. I've taught for over 25 years of interacting with the kids and really helping them with their learning is being with them in person, face to face. But what we don't want to see happen is this roller coaster that happened in the last school year where kids were in person and then had to go online and then in person and then online and then in person and online. That sort of back and forth yo-yo roller coaster that we experienced last year um, was not really conducive to to great education. It was difficult on parents. It was difficult on students and on teachers as well. And uh, we need to try to make sure that we don't get caught in that kind of scenario again. And I would have hoped that the government would have learned a lesson from last year about how to better approach um, in waves of COVID. But uh, we saw in the, the summer, they put out their plan saying, it's just back to normal. We're just going to go back uh, the way that we've always been. And um, I think that approach right from the get-go has been something that the association has been advocating against and trying to have um, really specific, distinct measures put into place. Let's reference a tweet that you sent out from, from your official account just before uh, New Year's Eve. You sent this out December 30th. Teachers, students, and parents deserve better leadership than this. You say, once again, leaving things to the last minute, not like there's been previous waves they could learn from. Then again, exhibiting any learning is not exactly a strong suit here. Beyond disappointing and frustrating. Jason, let's talk specifics. Uh, what would you like mm -hmm. to see from the Alberta government here, from the Minister of Education in particular? Well, I'd like to see them not advocate their leadership and the responsibility in this manner. So they've pushed everything down to school boards to, to do. Um, and what you get here then is an inconsistent level of measures and protocols across the province. We saw schools in the fall uh, have very different things happening and they're literally just across the street from one another. So a consistency in terms of masking requirements. And when school started, we didn't have that. But then, of course, you get the, uh, the C. MOH put a measure in place for students from four to 12. Um, having some consistency there and having some support there as well. So we know coming into this January, we heard that there was going to be mass and rapid tests for all students and staff. Well, those aren't there that uh, those materials are not at schools right now. Um, and we need to have a conversation about are the medical grade masks that they put in there the right ones or should they be KN95s? All the experts say KN95s or N95s would be more appropriate with the Omicron uh, variant and the rapid tests, they're just not there. So we have people coming to, to work with a, a promise and it's not there. And that's the bare minimum that they can do and they've not lived up to uh, fulfilling that. 
This is, uh, I, I guess, when, when, there's, you can't really say that there's a right answer with regards to the choices that parents are going to make. And I think that there's a lot of pressure on parents right now. And I know that people are in tough situations. I think of in particular, and I, and I hate to even start naming specifics because then I'm going to inadvertently exclude people. But I think of, of single parents. I think of parents who uh, are, are working multiple jobs to keep the family afloat. I think of people who don't have readily available child care. I think of people whose situations would qualify as inflexible. And, and right now, many of them I know because they're telling us in the responses to my Twitter poll uh, that they're exasperated and yeah. that they're worried today. Uh, do you have a message? I mean, I know that you're here speaking to our audience on behalf of thousands of Alberta's teachers, but teachers sure care about their students. They're telling us that on these responses to this tweet. What's your message to parents that are just looking to make the right decision for their family today? You know, I would say that uh, you sort of took the words out of my mouth there, Ryan, that teachers care about this as well um, and are feeling the same thing that parents are feeling. And parents have to do what they feel is best, but uh, we all need to make sure that we're all working towards a common goal of keeping our schools as safe as possible um, so that we can keep them open. Like I said, teachers want to be at school working with their students, but we all have a role in this. And so I know that it's difficult for parents to make these choices, but we all have to keep um, working together on this. I think that uh, I've seen a lot of um, just, you know, on social media, sometimes you can see a lot of division and a lot of polarization on this. And I think this is one issue that we don't need to polarize and all work together on trying to make things as best as possible in a really tight situation. So are you, what happens, I mean, at the, at the end of the year, I mean, I know that diploma exams have been impacted uh, mm-hmm. by this variant uh, to a certain degree in some circumstances canceled, right? I know that other people, I mean, this is, there's been so much flexibility required and resilience. I, I feel like I'm just using buzzwords, but they're all fitting. Yeah. And they're all true. I think of the high school students here and the, how brutal this is for them. I think of kids like our little guy, the, the kindergarten grade one, grade two experience. They, they just have no idea really what it's actually like. Are you concerned longer term that 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 kids are going to fall through the cracks, that kids maybe are just getting passed at the end of the year because teachers have really no way of gauging where students are? I mean, bigger picture, longer term, what's on your radar? I think long term, we need to do some work to really address um elements of students learning and how we can look at this. And I've been talking about this throughout the entire pandemic, that we have a really, really big opportunity here to fix some of the inadequacies or some of the the lack of quality or not quality, sort of inequality that we have within the education system. So when you look at uh, learning, for example, I know my colleagues are professionals and they will make sure that students need to know the things that they need to know by the end of the year. Um, Having taught, you know, grade 12 English for over 20 years, I know what students need to do to get prepared for a diploma exam, but not having to do that diploma exam work in class and preparing them allows me to focus on other aspects of their learning, other aspects of their reading, their literacy, their numeracy, their writing, Um, all those other elements we can bring in without those things sort of hovering over our heads. So I am fully 100% I'm confident that my colleagues are able to do the work that they need to do and covering the curriculum with their students the best that they can. But let's be honest, you also have, I I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but you got a whole bunch of teachers right now that are going, well, I'll be there in the classroom and I guarantee I'm getting COVID. So that's that. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things that we've also been fighting for is trying to get measures put in place that make sense and that are reasonable. So addressing class size, so we don't have classes that are over 30 or 40 right now during a pandemic. Um, Addressing substitute teacher concerns, you know, putting substitute teachers on contract so that they have a set place to go to support schools. They also have some um, own security themselves if they should happen to become sick. So that schools aren't scrambling when they have people who aren't coming to work because they're ill or they have to isolate. And then the rest of the teachers in the school are scrambling. They're giving up the preps. Principals are covering classes. They're doubling up classes in some cases. I've heard this before. And to me, that makes no sense where you have 40 or 50 kids in a classroom now. Um, And then also looking at other things such as filtration and and, uh, um, ventilation in schools. We've been talking about this since the summer of 2020, but I've seen very little movement by government on actually trying to put something that's tangible and actionable in place to address that issue as well. Yeah. And, and I guess some people will probably say, well, it's, 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 you know, when you're talking about bigger picture improvements and ventilation and things like that, so-called infrastructure improvements, you need big budgets and you need more time. 
Although maybe we're running out of that excuse uh, now that we're almost officially into year two, or maybe we're into year three of this pandemic, depending on your perspective. All I know is it's been two years for a lot of people that were kind of mentally preparing for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, as delusional as we may have been. But people right now are saying, what bigger picture improvements need to be made? In closing, can I ask you a pretty direct question? I mean, this is how people talk to each other at grocery stores and in lineups and over text messages to their friends. If there were masks, appropriate masks, readily available, if there were HEPA filters or different uh, measures taken to improve air quality as much as possible, if there were class size uh, amendments to be made, et cetera, et cetera. Are you cool with kids being back in school in the sense that recognizing that that there are benefits to kids being in school, there are benefits to in-person learning, there are trade-offs, uh, some of them negative, uh, to kids being home and isolating. Uh, are you cool if those improvements are in place, those steps are in place with kids being back in class? I'm, I'm always cool being in front of students and teaching them in that manner. But what I heard about a week and a half ago was our premier stood at a microphone and said, we were doing everything possible to guarantee that kids are being in school. And I'm paraphrasing his exact quote there. But what we got in terms of response from government was the bare minimum that could be done. It, it's, it's mind boggling and extremely frustrating to me and I take it out on, on Twitter sometimes, but there's things that could be done, should be done that should have been addressed months ago that we can still address now and today moving forward. We just need to see some political will on that. Jason Schilling, president of the Alberta Teachers Association. I know it's a busy day for you and for thousands of your colleagues. Thanks for making time for us today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I am with... Trisha MC, who chimes in on our live chat right now on YouTube. Shout out to everybody who's watching us live on YouTube right now. Everybody who's who's streaming us live using the Mixler audio app. Maybe you're on the road. Maybe you're headed somewhere. Thanks for taking Real Talk live streaming with you. Uh, and if you're if you're catching this later in the day, as most of you do, you can check out those live chat comments down the side of the screen on YouTube. Trisha just says, I have had it with resilience. The next person who asks me to be resilient gets a fat lip. And uh, Trisha MC, um, I am with you on uh, metaphorically handing out fat lips to people, to scenarios asking us to be resilient, because I get it. I, in all seriousness, uh, am so proud of uh, the millions of people who have uh, taken, uh, you know, we're talking in metaphors here, uh, punches after punches after punches, and you still keep going. But it is exhausting, isn't it? I mean, I'm coming to the table this morning. Literally, I am sitting at our dining room table. I am coming to the table this morning exhausted and so sick of this. And I get it, Trisha. And our little guy is upstairs right now. He's not in his grade one class. He's up on his iPad right now. And, and he's going to be doing some learning at home. And we're so proud of all the kids and what they've been able to do. But I get it. For those of you that are going, how much more of this will I be asked to endure? Now, it's, there is a bit of a phenomenon happening, though, and, and it's a bit concerning, isn't it? Or, or at least, at the, at the very least, it's tough to wrap our minds around. Because if your friends are like my friends, some of them are starting to say, I've been really diligent for a long time. I've been taking every possible step to protect my family and to protect myself and to protect complete strangers. But right now, it, it, it just seems to me like we're all going to get it. So I kind of just want to get it. And it's reminding me of that big party in Edson, Alberta, that made news headlines a few months ago, the party where everybody decided to just go get COVID. And there were rumors that people were bl blowing up and then and then exhaling right around the same balloons to ensure that they were getting, I mean, all kinds of wacky stuff and Ultimately, we know that that party clogged up ICUs in Edmonton, and, and ultimately, people literally died. Uh, people died as a result of that party. I thought of that as I heard a friend of mine say, you know what? I'm just, I just want to get it. I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of everything happening around me. I'm sick of the paranoia around whether or not I'm going to get sick. I see everybody getting sick, and I've just had it, and I just want to get it over with. We're sitting there going. But wait a second, 
But wait a second. If this is the attitude that everybody takes around this, this is going to be big trouble. And we're going to be talking to healthcare professionals this week. They're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. We don't want everybody just getting sick now. We don't want that happening. But I can't ignore when I look around, it seems like everybody has it. Is your world like mine? Does it seem like absolutely everybody that you know is either got it or thinks they might have it or is isolating because they think there's a chance that the symptoms that they're experiencing could be COVID-19? Pretty tough to wrap your mind around it. Let's take a look at what parents are telling us. This unscientific, unofficial Twitter poll that I put out on, uh, we're going to keep it open. I always like to run them for 24 hours to give you a chance to chime in on this. And we'll take a live look right now. I mean, as of approximately nine o'clock in the morning, mountain time. Good morning to those of you out east, 11 o'clock Easter. we got just over 5,000 votes here. Again, 55% of parents say that you are sending your kids to school if you're in Alberta uh, this morning. Lisa says, you know, uh, one of them for sure because he's in grade 12 and with his diploma exams canceled uh, in class work becomes his only way of being graded in a class that's needed for university entrance. Uh, Lisa says also grade 12 kids ha have had their final exams mostly canceled for two years now. And exam taking will be a huge skill gap. Well, what a great point from Lisa. Shannon says we're starting the week at home. Um, the kids will be two weeks post Dose two on Wednesday. Wow. She says Shannon's kids must have been there right as soon as it opened up. Uh, she says, so then we'll reconsider depending on how the next couple of days play out. But but she says, but we know how it'll play out. That from Shannon. Ashley says, I'm sending my six year old. I'm nervous, but he has had his first dose of the vaccine. Um, Ashley says my, our little guy needs school for his mental health. And that is the largest reason that we sent him to school this morning. Sean says, we've, we've been homeschooling. It says, my wife is carrying this huge task for our family for two years now. Uh, Sean says, uh, you know, between the lack of COVID measures in schools, the cuts uh, to schools when it comes to supports, EAs, overtime, et cetera, our son would not get anywhere close to the help that he needs. Allison says, our family is recovering from COVID, so our kids aren't going back quite yet. You know, what about this from helicopter dad <laughs> says we're not overly comfortable sending our kids back. So, so you know what? We decided we're going to let them decide. Um, one of our kids told us that they need the social aspect. And so they've decided to go back to grade eight. Uh, the other is a bit more cautious and wants to stay back this week, a grade 10 student uh, to see if COVID stats go down. Julian says, yes, we're sending our kids. Uh, but do I expect them to be in school for the next two weeks? Sure, don't. Uh, wonders, you know, does the Calgary Board of Education saying that the schools meet ventilation standards for occupational health and safety? D does that give me confidence in the board? Does it give me confidence in Alberta education? No, that from Julian. Tammy says, I'm sending kids to school unless they refuse for valid reasons. Uh, says our kids are 16. Sounds like they have twins. Our kids are 16 uh, with a history of attendance issues. Uh, but I want them to make the choice for themselves. They're in a specialized setting with few students and have no other outside activities. That from Tammy. You get the point here. I mean, I could spend an hour here, literally an hour reading you comments from parents. I mean, here I go again. Amanda, I can't help myself, Oils. I just keep getting to more of the comments. We want everybody to, to have a voice. We want to be able to use this platform so you understand. If you hear a comment that sounds like your words, you're not alone. Uh, no matter how you're approaching this situation, I don't think that there's one right answer. And I sure as hell don't think that parents deserve to be piled on for making whatever choice they make that's right for their family. Amanda says we're going to keep our little guy home for the week uh, until the unfortunate, inevitable first explosion in cases happens uh, or and or until they roll out rapid tests and masks. Shalane says, I will be reluctantly taking my six, nine and 12 year old to school, but I know that I will be crying harder than a first time kindergarten mom. And when they eventually get COVID-19, I will have mom guilt like no other. That from Shalane. Shalane's just keeping it real. That's how she's feeling about this. You can let us know what you think. Of course, we read these comments. These are ones that I've been reading you on Twitter. You can uh, please hashtag your tweets with Real Talk RJ. It's how we can ensure that we see them.
And you can send us an email anytime as well to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Many of you, uh, despite our extended winter break, uh, have uh, remained in touch with us by way of email, and we sure appreciate that. Uh, We keep an eye on the inbox, of course, all the time. And it's a great way to make sure that your messages don't fly under our radar. Uh, Every once in a while, the live chat gets going, and it's tough for us to stay on top of it. So email oftentimes is your best bet. I want to give a big shout out to the team at St. Albert Dodge. I was in there just a while ago, you know, I've been driving this uh, 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee and I've, I've been in their ear, you know, the 2022s are out and they're looking pretty good right now. And this is the exact time of year we're driving a Jeep. Uh, well, you know, you know, uh, it's worth it year round. But right now with the roads looking the way they are in our neck of the woods, Jeep's four wheel drive. It's been trusted since 1941. The Grand Cherokee, a perfect example of that. They've got them in stock, including the Grand Cherokee L with that third row of seating. You can check them out online, uh, shop online at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge under the sponsors tab on our website. Also, big shout out to our friends at Local Waste. If you follow them on social media, you may have noticed a bit of a rebrand, local environmental. And I think it says a lot about the work that they do. Of course, they're about more than just garbage trucks. They've been recycling uh, and handling the management of recycling pickup uh, for clients, big and small, for more than a quarter century. Still family owned. You can find local environmental under the sponsors tab on our website. And of course, don't forget, they present each and every week trash talk. I think the trash talk might be 20 minutes long coming up this Friday. If you have something you need to get off your chest, you can send it to it by way of uh, send it to us by way of our email inbox. Uh, before we get to Julie Van Rosendahl, and I'm looking forward to this conversation, we also wanted to remind you that we're so proud to partner uh, with the team at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners. Uh, the question of the week, we put that in front of you every single week to get a sense of where this audience is at, the issues that matter most to you. Now, coming up on tomorrow's show on Tuesday's Real Talk, we're going to be getting into the results of our most recent question of the week. We asked you to look back on the year that was on 2021. Well, we wanted to tandem that with the question of the week this week. It's just been posted. It's just been up for about an hour, and we're hoping to hear from more than a thousand of you. You can go to ryanjesperson.com, click on connect. It's right at the top of the page there. We want to know what you're looking at, what your crystal ball looks like when it comes to 2022, the stories that matter most, your expectations on the news cycle, what you think Canada will look like, what will Canadians encounter or be asked to manage in the year that comes. And of course, also, we ask you who you think is going to win the Super Bowl, who you think is going to win the Stanley Cup, and a couple other fill-in-the-blanks. I know that the editorial producer of this show is is probably going to be right now shaking your head and rolling your eyes because we did not. And Hoyles, I'm going to ask you to blame Chris Henderson and Ann Gordon, Ty, and Emily, and the entire team at Y Station, because I had nothing to do with this, but there were no questions about who's going to win the Larry O'Brien Trophy, the NBA champion, but I know, and you knew I was going to find at least 30 seconds for you in this show to talk about the Raps win streak. This is a big deal for Canada's team. Yeah, right now they are three games above 500. They were they were yeah, on a losing skid there for a while. Um, you know, with COVID, health and uh, safety protocols, they had lots of players out. Uh, now they've been winning and winning and winning. So when you were saying that all the teams are losing right now, no, 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 not the reps. That's right. You're reps. referencing my Sunday message where I was feeling, did I come across as a little, like, could, could you tell where my head was at when I was writing the introduction, like yeah. the opening paragraph for the Sunday message where I was like, we are experiencing all the feelings, all the all teams are losing. Uh, I mean, I, you know, and, and, and the kind of the way that we roll on this show is we jump back and forth. We, we, we roll back and forth between laughing and crying all the time. Um, I, I really don't actually mind stretches of minus 30. I mean, it kind of sucks. And, and there's the reality. I mean, there's, there's people that are living on the streets. There's, I mean, for a lot of people, minus 30 is, is, uh, is horrific, but I actually don't mind that kind of crisp cold. I was more being, I was being somewhat melodramatic about that. Um, the losing skids, um, sports is not always real life. Sometimes it is, but mostly not. And we don't really have to worry about that, but the Omicron, uh, variant. Uh, that's the one thing for me when you start to see those numbers. And and right now, I don't think that anybody even, I don't even know if the numbers are relevant, uh, except for maybe a high watermark uh, to sort of be able to compare to where we were a year ago or what have you. But with so many people testing at home and just staying at home and not re- reporting those results, I think it's safe to say the numbers are quite a bit higher than what we're seeing. But 6,000 plus oils in one day, that was one where I just went, 
I mean, I remember when Real Talk first launched, uh, when we were like January, February, March of, of 2021, and we saw 2,000 in a day and people went, oh boy. And we're now at least triple that, at least. Yeah. I mean, the numbers are astounding. It's exponential growth. That's how it works. So the more contacts folks have, the more likelihood, um, you know, that contact will then connect with that contact. And if someone's positive, oh, it's, it's, it's really tough to say. And also the idea that, um, you know, just because it's mild in one person doesn't mean it's going to be mild in another. Fair so, point. Fair point. I, and, and it's funny, you, you make these great points. Uh, you know, it's why it's why you're here, Sarah. Uh, but, I, <laughs> oh, you know, it's kind of funny because I can see uh, I can see you off camera, even, you know, during the interviews and things like that. And I'll, and I'll make a comment, which is an accurate comment, we, we, you know, which is, you know, we are seeing many reports anecdotally. And we've heard from some experts on Real Talk that Omicron, uh, while it's while it's it's contagious nature is unlike anything we've seen to this point. Generally speaking, the symptoms and we're talking uh, for the most part about a largely vaccinated population. So that's relevant. But the symptoms seem to be somewhat more mild. But I can see you kind of raise your eyebrows in concern, which is important. Uh, that reminder that just because one person's experience, maybe that that's not everybody's experiences and, and, and people are still dying. I mean, you got to keep that in mind. I think everybody's just trying to find the balance. Everybody's just trying to find a balance on 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 what life is supposed to look like right now. And And, and I guess depending on where you live or what your job looks like or how many family members you've got or how, how flexible your schedule can be. Those answers are going to be different for everybody. What it means for our team, if you're just joining us right now, if you're just tuning in right now, it means that we're doing this show from three different locations. Um, Sarah is at her home. Sam is just working magic out of the Real Talk studio Dude, right now. And, anyways. <laughs> and I'm home as well. And Sam, there's a very important question from Tanya, um, who's wondering, are you watering you there in the studio are you watering the poinsettia and and actually it's not you sam but someone is someone has adopted this plant that quite frankly i was ready to just I, i'm not gonna lie to y'all i was it, it was headed for the landfill i was gonna say it's notably absent from the studio as you can see here so it was uh, so what... dry it was a fire hazard <laughs> it was so dry <laughs> But Sarah Hoyles, uh, she, she rescues dogs. She rescues poinsettias. Uh, Tanya and others want to know, Hoyles, how's it doing? Oh, she's she's looking pretty rough. Um, <laughs> I also I also rescued the spider plant. Um, oh, people don't even know about the spider plant. Oh, right. Maybe we should keep that off people's radar. The spider plant is is it's coming around. She's looking. She's she's on the up and up. The poinsettia, or as I call it, the poinsettia. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I, I started uh, getting snobby. I started getting snobby with my pronunciation of, of it uh, just a couple of years ago when I heard a florist uh, continually assert the pronunciation of poinsettia in a conversation to me. And I sort of took it like they were trying to sort of like counsel me and <laughs> and help me with my pronunciation. So that's me. <laughs> but I but I was with I was camp poinsettia poinsettia for like 30, 40 years. So. I mean, I've been wrong before. I will be wrong again. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn. I'm a lifelong yeah. learner. So the, so the spider plant, the poinsettia, uh, we'll, we'll check in on them through the year. If you get that Christmas plant uh, to bloom again in time for next holidays, there's a prize in it for you. I will say there's a prize in it for you. Sam, can I get personal for a second? I mean, you, you know, we asked you before the show in our production meeting if, if, if you'd be willing to talk about your experience with with Omicron and with COVID-19. And, and uh, obviously you've, you've said that that's cool. You're, uh, you're, um, yeah. I guess what about seven, eight days now. And, and, and how are you feeling? I, I feel really good. And I, I want to put the caveat on top of everything that this is one person's experience, but uh, yep, Kelly and I both tested positive. Uh, we, had, we had one rapid test left and we both wanted to take them the day before we went back to work just so that we sort of, you know, knew that we were good to go and they came up positive. Um, we each had one kind of bad day of symptoms. I know there was one where, like, Kelly just sort of had headaches and was laying on the couch every day, all day. I was very congested. But, you know, like, all in, we we both experienced a cold. And I don't really want to say even a bad cold. But, you know, where I'm going with this is that, you know, this is the system working. This is, you know, Kelly and I were both... Uh, triple vax at the time we had just got our boosters and uh so i guess they hadn't taken effect yet but like you know when, when like contracting omicron as a young healthy person with two vaccines in me it was a very 
like sort of mild, ride it out at home type experience. And I mean, it wasn't a pleasant week. It was very weird not being able to leave my house, although it was, you know, minus a million outside. And and, uh, aside from like, you know, groceries being left on my front stoop by my parents, I didn't really step outside very much, pawned Sophie off onto uh, some some willing volunteers to give her walks. But, you know, all things considered, it was weird because like over the Christmas break, I kind of experienced two realities. On Christmas Day itself, I was at my parents' house and I was playing pool and drinking beer with my cousins. And it was like you know felt a little bit close to normal we were within the capacity Mm. limits and everybody in the room was double or triple vaxxed and we had a really good time together and then you know about a a week later just kind of crept in there and so you know it's it's there are you must have thought sorry to sorry to cut you off sam but you you must you must have thought at, at least at some point that uh that your initial symptoms were a result of the booster. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it was like it was kind of weird that it was just sort of this slide from like, oh, that's the that's the vaccine after effects to uh, oh, this is sticking around a little longer than we thought it would. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this uh, I mean, I think that that's something obviously that would be on a lot of people's radar. This is uh, again, like Sam said, you know, you, you sort of have this moment through the holiday season where everything feels like it's kind of quote unquote normal i don't even know what normal is anymore i don't even know what more normal means anymore i'm not sure that that there is such a thing anymore but i think we can all pick up what sam's putting down right you sort of feel like are, are we really emerging out of this do i see a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not an oncoming train and then all of a sudden whammo and fooled once fooled twice uh there you go Pardon me if I sound a little bit defeated. It's perfect timing uh, to welcome in our next guest uh, because I think she gets all of this. Uh, Julie Van Rosendahl has been a very good friend of this show uh, since before the show existed. Uh, She's a mom. She's a big deal. She's a celebrity. She's an author. She's a cook. She doesn't like being called a chef. She's a cook. But it was what she did. Uh, And Sam, why don't we put up her tweet here as we introduce? Oh, hi, Julie. How are you? I want to show off one of your tweets first before I come to you officially. She said, parents, I feel for you. This was on January 3rd. This is a week ago today. I know what it's like to keep young kids busy. And I can't imagine not being able to go places, have friends over or go to the park when it's minus 30 with schools closed in Alberta. Said, Julie, I'm setting up a free Zoom cooking camp for the rest of this week. Stay tuned. And we all went, what? And now a week later, she's got thousands of graduates. Welcome back to the show. It's nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. What an amazing start to 2022 this has been. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, uh, as soon as I saw what you were doing, I tweeted out. I was like, this is so cool. And uh, first of all, first of all, you're bailing a lot of people out. And second of all, can I just say, uh, you didn't say it's only $49.99 or it's three easy payments of $19. Um, you made yourself available. You created infrastructure on your website, uh, dinnerwithjulie.com, and you did this all out of the goodness of your heart. How come? Uh, because I know what it's like to try and keep young children busy. And I can't imagine during a pandemic how difficult it must be for parents to just, you know, come up with activities when kids can't see their friends, they can't go to the park when it's it's been minus 30 all week here in Alberta. And uh you know, my teenager is easy now. He's, he's 16. He's, he excels at social distancing. And, uh, I, so I just, you know, I wanted to just do what I, what I could, if there's something that I could do to help. And I tend to have these ideas and then, you know, tweet them out and see what the response is. The response was fantastic. And, you know, I know a lot of parents are at home cooking with their kids, baking with their kids, but it's a different dynamic when it's a different parent, as you know, Right. You know, a different or a different person doesn't have to be a parent, someone else's mom or dad. But uh, yeah, I just thought it, it might be fun. I've been doing a lot of Zoom events, Zoom classes over the pandemic. I've been baking with my my grand niece and grand nephews out in carbon when we can't be together because we used to bake together all the time. And now we've done it over Zoom a few times. So I thought maybe other kids would be into it, too. And it might alleviate some of that uh that boredom and maybe the pressure on parents well so cool and uh my social media was blowing up not not just because of you not just what you were posting but i i feel like i knew 
uh, at least a couple of dozen of the families that were joining you every morning. Uh, why don't we take, uh, Sam, if you want to tee up this video, we'll take a quick look. We just wanted to take a tiny little clip out of just one of Julie's free online kids cooking classes to give you a sense of what she was up to. Let's roll it. I used to make this with less butter. Now I make it with a little bit more butter. You don't have to measure it really precise, precisely for the goo part. About a quarter of a cup of butter. You could use um, margarine if you like, if you need to do dairy free. You could use um, any kind of milk. You could use oat milk or almond milk or coconut milk instead of the dairy milk if you like. <laughs> there you are. You're always banging the drum for butter, hey? Always banging the drum well, for butter. I you know what? I want it to be inclusive, right? There were a lot of kids <laughs> who are vegan who are joining. There are a lot of people who are dairy free. There are a lot of people who are gluten free. So I, I wanted to make sure all the recipes could accommodate all the, all these people, all these ways of eating didn't require running out to the store to grab something specific, right? We're trying to avoid going to the grocery store unnecessarily. So, so yeah, the trick was kind of getting recipes that could, uh, you know, teach young kids, teenagers, the teenagers really got me, you know, there's a lot of cuteness in those classes, but <gasps> the teenagers, let's this talk about the teenagers. Yeah, no, I mean, I have a teenager. I have a 16 year old, as I said, and I just I loved seeing the teenagers in the class, some of them with their headphones on, you know, some of them with their hoodies up and just and getting in there and cooking. Sorry, I, I talk with my hands. I keep hitting my microphone and uh, that. Yeah, they kind of got me deep in the field, seeing the, the teenagers showing up day after day. But it was really great because I set them up for 10 o'clock each morning. I wound up because the, the first class capped out at a thousand. So I wound up doing two a day, which is bonkers. I, I set my, my zoom account. I sort of temporarily boosted it to accommodate a thousand. I thought that's way more than we'll need, but just in case. And so the first one capped out at a thousand. Uh, I can't remember where I was going with this, but, but it became sort of a routine, right? Every morning at 10, what are we doing tomorrow? I wore my PJs on the first day. And so then a lot of kids started wearing their PJs. We we're all in our PJs. It was very cool. Honestly, I enjoyed it probably the most of all. It was just the best for me. Well, we're showing for anybody that's watching on YouTube, we're showing some of the responses right now from parents. And look at this. I mean, kids of all, all different ages. I love the rock and the PJs. Yeah. Um, and, and just gather around the kitchen. I look at this from Jonathan, who, who says to you, you're just you're a gem. We're so excited. Jonathan's daughter, just a huge beaming smile on her face. We got a great email this morning from Michael, who reached out to us. And he said, I am so excited that you've got Julie Van Rosendahl on the show. He says, my kids tuned into her cooking classes and loved them. And Michael says, even I learned something new. Michael submitted these photos of his uh, two little ones. And of course, the, the furry family member as well, the pup waiting to see what falls on the floor. Smart dog. Uh, Michael says, these are our cream puffs in creation. You didn't teach kids. And I don't know why I was just about to take a swipe at the great grilled cheese sandwich. I was uh, <laughs> grilled cheese didn't do anything to invite my sort of, but you didn't just teach people how to do grilled cheese sandwiches. You were, I saw you were teaching kids how to make croissant. Like that's uh, absolutely. not easy. You know, kids are way more adept at, at cooking than we give them credit for. I think, uh, you know, we, a lot of us tend to think of kid food, you know, and a lot of people said, Oh, you should do a kid's cookbook, but what's different about a, a kid's cookbook, right? Kids can make biscuits. Kids can make profiteroles. Kids can make dumplings. You know, they, we, we tend to sort of classify pizza and chicken fingers and cookies as kid food, but it's all kid food. Right. And it, it depends what they grew up with, their culture, their background, their, you know, where they live. There's just so much behind what we eat. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, you know, I, I wound up the week with a croissant class thinking, you know, there's some teenagers in there. There's some kids who are just more into the baking aspect, want more of a challenge. We did an all day class, started at nine, made our, our dough, our yeast raised dough. And then we did the lamination sort of over the course of the, the afternoon, we would meet at the top of the hour, do our roll and fold and then leave, put it in the fridge, go away for half an hour and come back. It worked perfectly. And, you know, it, they may not have nailed lamination on the first go. There are bakers, obviously, who dedicate their lives to the craft of, of making the perfect croissant or baguette. But every one I saw was um, was amazing. They had the layers, you know, and it it gives them 
an understanding of what goes into those pastries when they see them at the grocery store. You know, we had an opportunity to talk about wheat and how it behaves differently if it's bleached or unbleached or whole wheat and, and why the flour in our grocery stores can be a little bit different this year, you know, during a pandemic, during a, there's been a drought, we've had the worst wheat crop across Canada in over a decade, well over a decade. And, and it's affecting the wheat in our grocery stores, which makes it, you know, affect the, the wheat in our kitchens. So all these little conversations that, that pop up as we're baking, the kitchen is a great place to talk about all kinds of things. I feel like kids open up when they're in the kitchen, mine for sure. You know, we sit across the dinner table from him and, you know, how was your day? Fine. What did you do? Nothing. But <laughs> you get in the kitchen and he's blah, 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 blah. He was talking, he's chatting, right? Because you have a secondary distraction. You're doing something, kind of occupies part of your attention, but not all of it. There isn't, I was going to say there's no screen involved, but I guess when I was there, there was a screen <laughs> involved. But, you know, the fact that it was on Zoom, I think was different than if I, I did a Facebook Live. A lot of people said, oh, you can do a YouTube Live, YouTube, YouTube Live. You could do a Facebook live. It's different when I'm, I'm broadcasting. I'm not seeing the kids in their kitchens, seeing them if their cameras yes. were on, a lot of them had their cameras off, but being able to see them and they're, how's this, how's my dumpling? How does this look? Oh, look, I pinched it like this. How does my, my pastry looks dry? You know, that interaction was the best. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it all over again. Well, and I just absolutely love the, the the impact that it had. I mean, you talk about the goosebumps that you have. I mean, you should even read in our in our live chat right now. I mean, people are, you know, Brenda says we need more positive vibes these days. She mm -hmm. just says thank you to Julie. Um, how about this from Scott? I, I don't know how you're going to take this one. I'll, I'll drop the compliment, then I'll just keep moving. So you don't have to. He says JVR uh, in, in my world is a hockey pulley. That's always been James Van Riemsdyk. But Julie Van Rosendahl, the original JVR is a na <laughs> is a national treasure, says oh. Scott. I, but Joanne says this was so heartwarming on those cold minus 30 degree days. Uh, Julie, you're a gem. Julie, these are just a few people that are chiming in right now. Uh, I mean, that's got to be special. And you know what I love? I oftentimes talk, I, I talked about this with like Ian Hannah Mansing and a couple other people where you, you just never know the impact that an investment in a young life will have, right? And you wonder if maybe this last week of you donating your time and doing this uh, of your own accord uh, may have planted a seed with even one little kid that's going to grow up to accomplish something phenomenal in the culinary arts, you know? Well, you know, and even if they develop a love for, for cooking, you know, a love of, of cooking it, some culinary skills that are essential for long-term health. You know, I had a friend who texted me who I hadn't spoken to in years and, and said, you know, I overheard a coworker saying their teenagers were in the classes and then now they're looking into culinary arts programs. It's so great. If I, you know, can, can cultivate that love of food, that's why I do what I do. And I, and the gratitude is it's, it's wonderful to hear all these things. There are so many people who donate their time and their, their energy in their communities in so many different ways, you know, and I, I love that I'm able to do, do what I love and engage with kids in a way that gives me so much joy and reminds me why I do what I do. Um, you know, it benefits me immensely. And, and I am so grateful. Can I, this is, it's so important to, to recognize all the people out there who, who have kids who are working in healthcare, who are working in grocery stores, who are working in restaurants, who are educators. You know, my sister is a principal and she has been working so many extra hours throughout the pandemic, you know, doing contact tracing, making sure her staff are safe, her students are safe, making sure it's, she has subs, you know, booking subs. There's so many people doing extra work uh, because of this pandemic and, uh, and working hard and, and stressed out. So, you know, if there's something that I can do to help alleviate that, it's, it's not just me. Everyone's do, going above and beyond, right, right now. And that's the key, I think. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the scope of this, you know, and it keeps coming. It keeps coming. I keep comparing it to, uh, did you ever go to aerobics classes or jazzercise classes? No, you know, no, no, you didn't. Did, you no. didn't. 
you know, and the, the instructor would be like, it's okay. We're almost done. Three more, two more, one more. And then they'd be like 12 more, 10 more. And you're like, oh, I was almost there. Right. I keep thinking of that. And, and, uh, Again, I have no idea where I was going with this. Well, can but, I know? Uh, but you know, you I know where you're going with it. You're 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 speaking. <laughs> you're, well, first of all, you're speaking right to my core, yeah. and you're probably speaking to thousands of people who are going to hear this and watch this today because you're right. It just feels like wave after wave after crushing wave, and you kind of yeah. go like, "When the hell is this?" going to be done. Like when yeah. like, I'm, I'm watching, I mean, I'm, and I'm barely a football fan, but, but I love just great moments in sport and, mm -hmm. and the, the Las Vegas Raiders and the San Diego chargers have this wild overtime game last night. And, and, and it's to see who gets to go to the wild card game and who goes, not the point. And I'm looking in the stands and there's like thousands of people crushing beers and having a great time and celebrating sport and celebrating their social lives. And, and, and I'm, and, and we're like, and I'm not, it's not, woe is me. Don't take it the wrong way. But like, we're sitting here isolating and locked down and got nothing going on. And next right. weekend's canceled. And the weekend after that is canceled and everything's canceled. And I'm going, yeah, we're looking for a little joy. And you yep. gave people like Joanne just said, and like Brenda just said, you gave people that joy they needed. Well, and, and I think I think the the point of of all the you know the the scope of of this the the waves after wave after wave and then these other you know stressful events in the world it can be overwhelming and if we all look at the people in our immediate communities you know and what can we do for my, the person who lives next door and I feel like people are paying more attention to the the needs of the people around them and if we all do that. It's going to sort of, it's going to carry us through this, you know, um, it. you know, and, what, uh, small things, small things, right? Small things. Well, and, and what you did isn't small, but, but it's amazing. <laughs> um, people that, that may have missed it. Um, a very cool opportunity to go to dinnerwithjulie.com right now to your website. They can download the recipes and they can download the videos, right? So if they didn't catch it yes. live, they can still watch the cooking class. And I know that after people hear this, a lot of people are going to go do exactly that. So dinnerwithjulie.com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of our mutual friend, Ian Hannah Mansing, I was a little pissed off at him last night, as a matter of fact, when I, when I saw you featured on the national, but <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to lie. I did want the exclusive, um, but, but sent All a right. quick, send a quick note to Ian. We're okay with sharing you as long as it's broadcast coast to coast to coast. People need to know <laughs> the beauty that is JVR. Julie, thanks for doing this. It's so nice to see your face again from, from our household and our family to yours. A very happy new year. Thank you. Can I just add one more line after you so eloquently wrapped that up? You could, you could add like 10 more lines if you want. Okay, okay. I just want to say, because I've had so many people, parents, kids ask if there will be more, there, there will be more. Um, it's not, there's just so much interest. I, how, how can we not do more? So uh, I'm going to figure out how to, how to best do it, but weekends, the occasional weekend, the occasional weeknight, we're going to make dinner together. If anyone wants to join, um, how, you know, it's, there's still a pandemic. It's still winter and kids will always be interested in, in cooking. So as long as kids are interested in learning for free, I'm not going to charge for it. Anyway, I just wanted I, to say, are, okay, but hang on a second. So can, can I ask you like a, a kind of like, an, <laughs> I got to ask you, I want to, I want to make it awkward for a second because I noticed that you're, you're probably going to be like, I can't believe he's bringing this up. Why are you bringing this up? But oh, I no, saw there was, the, me. well, there was like a, there was like a bank. There was a big bank that, that saw oh. what you were doing and, and they were, you knew I was going to bring this up and the, and the bank tweeted and they were like, how great is this that Julie's doing this? And they were like, we all want to like buy her a new oven. And, yeah. and I saw it and I was like, wow, like that's pretty. And then you were like, nope, nope. You're like, I'm not no. partnering with anybody. I'm not taking it. I'm not accepting the new oven. I happen to know just because we do, you know, for example, like for our Patreon supporters, we do private little parties like mm -hmm. on New Year's Eve last year, on Christmas totally. Eve this year. If you want to be able to have like 300 or 500 or a thousand people on a Zoom call, even that costs money. You got to pay extra. Yeah. So you are, in, you're incurring some cost here. So, so what, what's the deal? Why wouldn't you take the new oven? Oh, geez. That's another... <laughs> That's a, you know, okay. If, it's, okay, if there's it to more be, to it, if there's no, no, more no, to I it, mean, then, uh, no. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate the gesture for sure. I mean, my oven is beautiful and it's very high maintenance and it has been, took me a long time to fix last year. It took four months. It was out of commission. Uh, it's a La Cornu. It's a European oven. It's very fancy, very Instagrammable, but not a great oven, but, but functioning It's totally fine. I didn't need an, another oven to continue with these classes, which was insinuated in the tweet. Um, 
And, and yeah, so they reached out and other people reached out and said, what can we do for you? Let's raise money. Let's attach a fundraiser. Let's attach, you know, let's raise money for this organization. That road. Can we, can you use chicken? And we're going to, and I just said, I, this is about the kids. This is about the kids. It's not about me benefiting from a new oven or making money off of people's hardships and, and stress and anxiety. This is about the kids who are who are anxious. I've had so many messages from parents who said, my kids are so anxious right now and this brought them out of their shell. Sorry. <laughs> it's about them, you know, and it's about supporting them. And I know the focus is, is often on supporting large organizations. And a lot of those organizations have been on the receiving end of a lot, a lot of financial support through the government, through private um, individuals, through companies. A lot of them have had huge surpluses through the pandemic, which is great. Um, but this is for the, this is for the kids and the families, like it's for them. And I don't want to, um, attach anything to it. You know, I'm happy to do this. And I'm thinking, you know, in the future, maybe, um, we'll have guests come in. There are so many great food voices, um, that I'd like to, to introduce people to, Oh um, man, uh, Julie, you oh are, my gosh, sorry, you, you are, st- <laughs> no, and I, I love it. I just love what you are. You are in real time. Oh, oh. You are creating, you're like, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know that a lot of people are going to be so excited to hear this. Like now right. you're starting to talk, you're talking about bringing in other people. To, and now you're going to yeah. start, I'm just going to be the guy in the, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the guy in the back being like, you know, you could really monetize this, Julie. You can know, really monetize this. It's okay. I don't, I don't. And I know that a lot of people make their living in this way. So, you know, the people, if I invite other, other chefs, other, um, culinary instructors, I will possibly put it out there as an option for people to, to donate what they can, because I do not want this to be restricted to people who can afford it. You know, how much money you have has exactly zero to do with how good a person you are. Right. I don't want this to be limited to people who can, who can afford the fee, um, you know, and I could say it's this much, but if you can't afford it, reach out, which I often do, but it's, it's hard to ask, you know, it's hard to ask. And I don't want to make people ask. I just love and it. I, 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 you know? I, just, I, I just love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, Jilly is watching us live. She says, Julie, I appreciate what you're doing. It's seriously amazing. Uh, I think if people are able, lots of people would like to donate something small. She says, I don't have a kid, but uh, I would love to give $5 towards this. Joanne makes a very good point. Says, if you want to support Julie, you can buy her cookbooks. You can try her recipes. Her recipes are fabulous. Dinnerwithjulie.com. Um, and then, of course, Sharon, who makes a very good point, says it's not always about the money. Um, yes. I, it, I, it, you yes, know what? Sharon. Actually, in life, in life, it's very rarely about the money. And I'm just uh, I'm just grinding your gears. I'm just having some fun with it, Julie. But uh, no. I think it's totally amazing. This is partly why you're so great at what you do is you, you go down those roads. Oh, but go you, you're on. Right. It's not all about money. And we hear, you know, don't work for free. Don't do your I, my whole career is around sharing food, teaching people how to feel comfortable in the kitchen. Like sh- food is for sharing. Mm. And I, and this is, it's always been sort of a tricky balance. How do you make a living, you know, but also share, share this, this, this knowledge and, you know, any, any knowledge that I have. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Sharon is right. You, everything that you do isn't, isn't for money, right? People do a lot of things for a lot of different reasons and people volunteer in their communities. People, volunteer lots of time in their communities. People shovel their, their neighbors walk people bring, you know, food to their people who need people volunteer at schools. So this is just a a way that I can do what I can to help. Right. I have the technology. Um, I have a kitchen, (laughs) you know? So anyway, I love hearing you describe your oven. It's like, it's like you, you talk to people that have like just like the highest end sports cars, right? Yeah. Or like the most beautiful SUVs, European ones typically, um, Italian ones in particular, mm-hmm. uh, and Br- and British ones. I got a buddy who just bought a Range Rover, and he's just couldn't he couldn't be more in love with it, and yeah. and absolutely ready to sell it already. Uh, yeah. He's experiencing conflicting emotions. These are the things with these finely tuned things, like your oven, um, high performance, yeah. high maintenance. 
right? Exactly. I mean, it's beautiful. And people keep saying, oh, but it's so pretty. Yes, but it is not <laughs> yeah. functional and it keeps running hot. And, you know, it took me four months to find someone who would work on it. And then the repair person who came said, you know, these fancy European ovens, you can't have them calibrated. You just kind of have to know and adjust. And so I will be on, on my own going and and looking for a new oven at some on, point this year on it's my just, own <laughs> on my, on my okay. own but uh, i do okay. miss the old ge electric range that came with my house you know people think oh she's got such be- a beautiful oven beautiful kit beautiful you don't need it right like the old ge electric range was hey amazing hang on, hang on. and this this happens every single time you come on here because because what happens is I'll, I'll wrap the interview and then we'll talk for I another know. 20 minutes and then i'll wrap again and then we'll go on for another 10 minutes but let me ask you this because people care about what you think because you're a pro um and i'm i'm a little surprised to be honest to hear you say that you miss your electric range i've always thought that natural gas oh, yeah. is kind of the cat's ass right so what is it what do you what do you like about electric well, the electric oven, I do like a gas stove top and oh, electric pardon oven. Me, pardon That's me. my okay. favorite combo. Yes. But so the coil elements, I mean, it was fine. It was totally fine. But the oven, it heated up like that. It held its temperature. It was even like it was just it was easy. It was not high maintenance. I could you know get it fixed. It didn't even need fixing, even though it was old when I moved into the house. But the point is, you don't need expensive, fancy, you know, William Sonoma, this, I, I'm not a very gadgety person. I have mixing bowls and spatulas and forks and tongs and like not a whole lot of fancy things, but people cook differently. A lot of people love their, you know, their instant pots and their air fryers, yeah. which are just tiny little convection ovens, um, and have do great things, right? Like there's, there's a place for all those tools and, and, and people love them. And if it helps you get dinner on the table, that's all that matters. Exactly. If it makes you happy. I don't know. Exactly. I, have like Cher- I have Cheryl Crow singing in the back of my mind. Yeah. But if it makes you happy, uh, and like you said, if it gets you in the kitchen, perfect. You have to sit around while I read you a little bit more praise. And and, oh. and, 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 and then we will allow you to move on with your day. Alyssa says, <laughs> putting these sessions on cost Julie money. It takes a great person to put that aside for the betterment of society. Uh, Gina is among those who's wondering, uh, what about an adult camp. Um, I suspect, you know, you t- I've, I've hosted some events, some virtual events on Zoom, and I've always asked people, especially when I'm doing a keynote speech, would you please turn your cameras on? Because it's very hard to deliver a keynote speech to like 300 black boxes that are just staring back at you. But I wouldn't be surprised if some of the cameras turned off during your cooking classes or because it's adults that are there learning and they just don't <laughs> want to they, yes. they get busted. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, Tracy, with the question that we're all wondering, what did you do with all of the things that you baked last week? Tracy says, Julie's neighbors must be so lucky. Oh, yes. My neighbors do get a lot of door drops. Uh, I have some toasted croissant here right beside me that I have not been oh, eating. Why you gotta, oh, why you got to? crunchy. Yeah. I, I eat a lot of it. You know, I have a hungry teenager. I freeze a lot of it, but I do package up a lot of it and just drop it on my neighbor's doorsteps. It's never a problem. Amazing. Dinnerwithjulie.com is where you can uh, check out the videos, get the recipes. Um, I heard that your newest cookbook is sold out already. Is that true? Uh, Yes, it's sold out uh, right before Christmas. And because there's so many supply chain disruptions, paper shortages, even though I get them printed in Manitoba, uh, I won't be able to do a reprint until probably late spring, maybe summer. So, so yeah. It's, there's a few bookstores who, that still have a few copies. They're only in an independent bookstores and, um, and some have a few copies, but. Um, it's always nice when you do yeah. something and it sells out right away. Uh, yeah. and, and, and while you, you feel like, oh, it'd be great if we could meet that demand. It, it's also like, well, next time, maybe you shouldn't sit on your hands. You know, maybe you should get it as soon as it's available. You know? right, right away, Cause, right? Cause if we put our name on it, it's going to sell out. So <laughs> Julie, nicely done. Thanks for your time today. It honestly like makes my day every time I see your face. And I know that uh, I speak on behalf of a lot of real talkers who would say the exact same thing. Cause they're telling us as much in the comments, um, oh, have an amazing week. And thanks for what you're doing for people. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you got it. That's Julie Van Rosendahl. Um, if, if you read her bio on her social media, I think it says something that she's like writer, cook, eater. She just like, she loves it. She loves the spirit of getting into the kitchen and drawing people in and creating that uh, desire to understand. And 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 I think to, to maximize the, the you know, the, the relationship that, that people can have with food and understanding healthy cooking and, and good habits for young people and everything. I just love it. I love it. I could go on for ages. 
If you don't feel like cooking, though, uh, I'm happy to tell you that the folks at the Dairy Queens of Northwest. Oh, Julie, she just waved bye 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 bye. Julie, thank you so much for everything. Um, our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want me to remind you that if if maybe today's a day where you don't feel like cooking and you don't feel like sitting in front of the oven or whipping something up from scratch, they're ready to serve you through the drive-throughs at Palisades Nemeo, Newcastle Westmount, and Baseline Road. That's where we went the other night. Minus 26 degrees. It was about minus 40 with the wind chill. And what did our family need? blizzards and so i made my way to dairy queen i had the score blizzard on the recommendation of this show's editorial producer sarah hoyles my wife carrie had the strawberry cheesecake blizzard and wyatt uh sarah you support my choice i know of the score blizzard and wyatt rudy went with the chocolate chip cookie dough blizzard uh now the good news is is that because i picked them up i was able to quality check all three of them on the way home and i can tell you in my humble opinion the score blizzard emerged at the top however all three were worthy of praise at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And if you're looking for those, uh, I mean, you know, we talk about Friesen Brothers all the time. There's 16 locations across the province of Alberta. Whole bunch of options for you here. I mean, this is perfect timing following our conversation with Julie Van Rosendahl. She's talking about flour. She's talking about the basics of of baking, the the, the core ingredients you're going to need. Of course, they have all those at Friesen Brothers. You know what they also have, though? A team of Red Seal chefs that prepares hot food. They've got these fresh kitchens. Uh, You can walk in there right now and pick something up to go. Your family's uh, not going to know the difference. I mean, this might be like what grandma and grandpa used to serve around their table. The roasted root vegetables, the braised beef short rib whatever you're feeling they've got it at Friesen brothers alberta owned and alberta grown now before we get into uh it's a weekly tradition for us courtesy of our friends at kubi energy uh we 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 kick off the week uh on the right foot with some positive reflections i also wanted to remind you that though it is uh january 10th um this is our first show of 2022 Uh, That also, of course, means that it's our first show of the month, which means that it is time to award a Real Talk Crescent mug. Not the one I'm drinking out of. We send you a brand new one, uh, never been used before, and it's uh, going to the winner of our Real Talk email of the month. You may remember back on December 8th, and I believe I read the email on December 9th on that show, uh, an email from Curtis. And Curtis wrote in to talk about photo radar, but he took an angle on photo radar that I had not considered. And there's nothing new there. Uh, the real talk audience is oftentimes putting things in front of us, angles we had not considered before. It's what makes the show so strong, and we're so grateful for it. Curtis wrote in to talk about photo radar and white privilege. And he wrote in to say what gets ignored a lot in this whole cash cow debate about photo radar is when a person of color gets like a, a jaywalking ticket, you know, or, or, or when police may stop an indigenous man, for example, for not having a bell on his bicycle, you know, our, our prominent newspaper columnists writing about that, our prominent politicians tweeting about that. No, Curtis says they say obey the law, follow the rules. But then when they themselves columnists, politicians, and others get tickets for breaking the law. Oh boy, are they incensed. Curtis went on to say, let's face it, we all know a white girl who got off a speeding ticket when she started to cry, or a white man who had the privilege and free time to go to court to get his ticket reduced, or who was given the benefit of the doubt and given a warning. He says, photo radar does not judge you based on skin color. It judges you based on the law you broke. This is just a quick excerpt out of Curtis's email. I read it in its entirety on the show. It knocked my socks off. It was one of those moments where I read it and I said, that is a point I have never even considered in this debate. And Curtis impacted my opinion and my perspective on this issue. And for that, Curtis, you are the author of our Real Talk email of the month for December. We're going to get in touch with you and we're going to ship you that mug. Don't forget, anytime you take the time to send us an email, you are automatically in the running for our email of the month. And we give away 12 mugs every calendar year. Our friends at Kubi Energy want to remind you that, you know, this is the time of year people sit there and say, well, what are the people with solar power doing, eh? What are the people with solar power doing, eh? Now that it's uh, limited sunlight and uh, minus three, what are the people people with solar panels doing? Uh, Jake would love to talk to you about what life's like with solar panels right now because your opinion... Or your understanding of where solar is at may be outdated. The advancements that are being made these days are extraordinary. And that includes 
the efficiency of solar panels as well as the battery storage that's available. You can go online to kubienergy.ca if you like for a free quote or to learn more about what present day and the future of solar looks like with Kubi Energy. Now, every Monday, our first show of every broadcast week, uh, we get the week started off on the right foot. Uh, we focus on the positives, if you will. We, we fill our buckets. It's a tradition presented by Kubi Energy called Positive Reflections. Now we're going to get to an email from Ross coming up in just a little bit. Ross, as a matter of fact, wrote a note to another real talker he's never met. And I'm just going to be the conduit. Uh, but first, I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is Red Wings captain, Detroit Red Wings. I'm talking NHL hockey. This is Dylan Larkin. And check this out. This is absolutely hilarious. Sorry. Now you hear him say sorry. Oh, no. Oh, oh no, no, he says. For the benefit of everybody listening to this on the podcast, Dylan Larkin in warm-ups feels terrible because he just shot a puck wide. He hit the glass behind the net, and he knocked over a fan's beer. That's right. He knocked over their beer. You got 20 bucks? So now he's talking to the trainer. I got 20 bucks in my dry saw. I knocked over the guy's beer. You got what? I knocked over the guy's beer. I feel bad. So he's talking to Rick Zuber. Uh, Rick Zuber Rick, is on the yeah, training the staff for the Detroit Red Wings. See Listen him? to this. In the, gray, in the red, red Wing sweatshirt, first roll. Yeah. So Dylan Larkin makes sure, and we can see here now that the twenty dollars has been delivered. Dylan Larkin, the captain of the Detroit Red Wings, who's having a great year, by the way, scoring at more than a point a game clip. And maybe that's why the hockey gods are smiling upon him, knocked over a fan's beer behind the net and made sure that that fan was compensated so they could go buy another couple of cold ones. I absolutely love it. That made me smile. I thought it was great. I already have Dylan Larkin on one of my fantasy teams. This made me think maybe that guy should be wearing the C. We'll think. We'll think about it. Uh, many important decisions to be made. And, and this email from Ross, this is the positive reflection that I want to leave you all with this week. Now, Ross says, uh, Ryan, I've, I've fallen behind uh, when it comes to checking out shows. Um, he says, so sometimes I'm a few days behind. He says, there was a recent email that, that stood out to me. He says, there's, there's a real talker. I hear you reference her. Her name is Kim. Ross says, but she's always going to be known to me as ripples whether she likes it or not now ross says now I'm, I'm going through the symptoms of a cerebral stroke ross says i had brain surgery in in may of 2021 and i am not the man that i was and i likely never will be ross says i'm a 38 year old that's used to working and, and playing sports and going to the gym and, and hiking but now i'm struggling to find a place in this world uh, with visual and vestibular deficiencies uh, staring the side effects in the face daily with little reprieve is exhausting, but it's important to note, not impossible. He says, I, I remember, you know, you, you were talking about some of your listeners in past that may have been a bit sensitive to strokes. And, and you talked about your uncle who was a victim of a stroke and he was not the same man that he once was. And he lives with that reality daily. Ross says your show and the topics and in this specific case, the community, though it's a daily source of motivation, it reinstills that there are real people out there. And that includes Kim. He says, Kim wrote in to talk about the ripple effect of these conversations and the ripple effect that Real Talk has had on her life. And it just absolutely resonated with me. He says, I'm never going to forget moments like this on Real Talk. The, the talk just not about how you live your your life in the moment but bigger picture in other words the ripples and he says and while we may hear about people's unfortunate circumstances it's nice to know that you are never alone here's to ripples that from ross so kim aka ripples you may not even remember making the comment on a real talk episode past but it resonated with this audience member who took the time to get in touch with us you your comment on ripples had a ripple effect with ross recovering from his stroke and that made our day you can send your positive reflections into us anytime 
We recommend you send them by way of email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. And of course, we feature them every Monday morning, courtesy of our friends at Kubi Energy. Coming up a little bit later on uh, this week on the show, we want to get to some real talk, some sort of basic questions like, how come some parts of the world are totally back to normal and we're not? What are we supposed to do when it comes to making decisions on whether or not we should go into work or cancel our vacation plans? Is it cool to fly? If I do travel, should I be posting it on Instagram or keeping it to myself? These are the questions we know that you're asking. These are the answers we will seek. Thanks for making time for us today, friends. Make it a great Monday, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.